everyone. Um, welcome. Sorry about the delay tonight. Um, we will get started with our pledge. So I will have our student representative, um, Akira Doganyaro, lead us in the pledge. If I can have everyone please stand, face the flag, put your right hand over your heart. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which we stand, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You may be seated. Thank you, Akira. Um, we are meeting together, but broadcasting remotely tonight and welcome all those who are participating by watching through YouTube. As a reminder, we welcome public comment and have provided a mechanism for you to make public comment by leaving voice messages to be played to the board and the public during our broadcast. If you wish to speak at a future meeting, please go to our public participation page on www.lbschools.net, which will give you more information about how to give public comment. As a reminder, in conformance with the Brown Act, when we hear testimony on an item that is not listed on the agenda, a full discussion of that topic would have to be delayed until such time as the item can be publicly posted in advance as a regular agenda item. The board has been meeting in closed session regarding matters listed on today's closed session agenda and wishes to report that no reportable actions were taken. Okay, uh, public hearing, we have none. Um, agenda items for separate action or adoption of the agenda as posted. Based on a discussion earlier today, I think we may have a change on the agenda. Yumi? Yes, board members, we respectfully request that um, new business item resolution 031721-A be changed from an action item to an informational item. Thank you. Thank so you. I move to approve the agenda as amended. Second. Uh, discussion? All in favor, and even though we're meeting in person, um, because we're wearing masks and it's going to be hard for the public to tell um, who's voting and how we're voting, we're gonna go ahead and um, use a roll call vote. So, all in favor, Dr. Benitez? Aye. Ms. Kerr? Aye. Mr. Otto? Aye. Mr. Miller? I'll abstain because I didn't hear the, <laughs> I just got here. Okay, I vote aye. So that passes 4-0 with one abstention. We just voted to accept the agenda as amended. We are changing the resolution item from an action item to an information item. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, okay, next we have approval of minutes. Move approval. Second. Discussion? All in favor, Dr. Benitez? So we're gonna get this right. We've had a day and a half to practice. We've been doing it from uh, home. I, I vote <laughs> aye. Uh, Ms. Kerr? Aye. Mr. Otto? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And I vote aye. So hearing, um, no opposition or abstentions, that passes 5-0. Ah, introduction of our student board member. Tonight we have Ms. Akira uh, Dogonyaro from Renaissance. So welcome, and we are excited to hear your report. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Superintendent Baker, Deputy Superintendent Brown, board members, and everyone else watching tonight. I'm Akira Daganyaro, student body president at Renaissance High School for the Arts. As we're all aware, this past year has been very eventful and unordinary. Yet a lot has happened at Renaissance since your past meeting with former president Hannah Wells, which was October of 2019. At the end of our 20, uh, 2020 spring virtual year semester, we closed it with an amazing drive-through celebration for the class of 2020 to praise their hard work and success, even in the midst of a global pandemic. 
To kick off a great summer, we held our first annual Summer Art Fest, which encouraged not only current students, but alumni to pr practice and showcase what they love with the rest of our LBUSD community. At the start of our new academic year, ASB held a pre-registration celebration, including balloon arches, great music, and huge posters welcoming all of our students into the first semester. Normally for all incoming ninth graders, student council leads stu campus tours along with team building activities to really break the ice and introduce freshmen to others of their class. But due to distance learning, we all held a virtual orientation where they were able to meet and ask questions to all of our ASB members, arts teachers, and our ASB advisors, Mr. Byrne and Ms. Dowell. After a month of adjusting to sc school online, we held our first virtual spirit week to begin the year with great school spirit and student involvement. Here at Renaissance Spirit Weeks really bring students and staff together. Not only are they fun, but they are diverse and allow our students to step out of their ordinary. If you don't know, Renaissance is known for our performances, hence us being a performing arts school. Even with us being in quarantine, we found, we've still found ways to showcase our art. During the fall, our vocal music department held their annual cabaret night, virtual edition, via YouTube premiere. This was an event focused on togetherness, allowing our vocal music students to perform featuring solos, and even including different classes such as vocal jazz, chorale, chamber, and treble singers. Along with these activities, ASB has been making posts for awareness months. As some of you may know, it's Women's History Month, so our social media has been flooded with posts around the theme of this month and vice versa for other months. Because our school is relatively small, we've been taking a huge priority in sending birthday cards to all students and staff on their special day to really make them feel appreciated and valued. In mid-November, we held a Christmas tree fundraiser where we partnered with the common vendor, Wood Mountain Christmas Trees, to provide holiday joy through a variety of trees, wreaths, and garlands. This is something new that we've done, and the outcome was pretty great, bringing students, staff, and parents together to enjoy some evergreen swag. Shortly after this, we held our annual Club Rush. Club Rush for Renaissance is where all of our student-led clubs come together to share information, network, and promote their club with others. During a normal year, we would set up tables and each club would share their treats or give out stickers while sharing information of what their club is about, when they meet, and how to join. Yet in this distance learning year, we created a PowerPoint with a slide assigned to each club, allowing them to design it their own way, giving the same information that will be shared during our normal club rush. Along with their custom slide, student representatives from each club were able to sign up for an Instagram Live with me through our RHSA ASB page and promote their club that way as well. During each live, I asked a series of questions over the course of 10 minutes, and it was such a great experience, almost as if it was a talk show. As a result, we now have over 26 clubs. I can truthfully say that using Instagram Live or RHSA has definitely helped us to connect with not only our students, but our community as a whole. Bringing in the new year, we held a fabulous interactive movie night, encouraging all of our artists and their families to join for the fun. This activity was held on the last day of our semester one finals. It allowed students and families to just sit back after a long day, relax, and watch a good movie. The movie was shown via Zoom webinar, so students were not only um, not able to have camera or mic access, but they were able to communicate with their friends in chat. Our movie night was definitely a total success due to lots of participants joining, great feedback, and requests for more. In addition, students and staff continue to build and nurture our visual art and performing arts community through inclusive and collaborative activities for all students. Our PTSA, more commonly known as PARTS, has been extremely busy with supporting our school by hosting numerous restaurant fundraisers. From the beginning of this school year to now, they've scored six different fundraisers from, for, for us from places we all love. <laughs> My personal favorite was the fundraiser at Panera because their food is just simply top tier. <laughs> Not only do they fundraise to give back to the school, but they've been fundraising for their annual PARTS scholarships for seniors. There are two different scholarships they give out, the Bart Forbes Scholarship as well as the Nanette Davis Scholarship. Along with submitting an essay, seniors are able to apply for these scholarships by being a full-time student enrolled at Renaissance, having a minimum of a 3.0 GPA, successfully graduating, and having proof of enrollment as an undergraduate student at some type of post-secondary college, university, art school, or the military for the 2021-22 school year. The tradition of offering these amazing scholarships to our seniors is one of the most rewarding activities for parts, in their own words, of course. Upon the start of our second semester, our student council upperclassmen drafted and mailed out letters to all of our wonderful freshmen to congratulate them on the success of completing their first ever semester of high school. This was something extremely inclusive for our freshmen due to the fact that we are distance learning and they come, they've come into high school this way, making it almost impossible to socialize and make new friends. With us reaching out to them, we've established communications and even great fellowships. 
Adding light to this situation has been announced at Long Beach is now in the red tier, meaning that students are able to return to campus around half capacity. With that being said, our ASB is in the works of filming a campus tour video for all new students to view before coming to campus and getting uh, to know their way around their new home. In our video, we will be giving a very distinctive tour of what each building is, as well as where and what classes are held inside of it. Our campus is such a safe space for our students, allowing them to find their true artistic selves. Additionally, our yearbook team has held a school-wide yearbook art contest, encouraging students to compete within four different categories, including photography, creative writing, drawing and painting, and digital art. Each category had two winners, first and second place. All first and second place winners got their art featured in our yearbook, along with category prizes. Along with this, our yearbook has, been, um, has made very specific highlights for our seniors, such as seniors with jobs, seniors with cars, as well as seniors with pets. Another amazing thing happening at Renaissance is that our dance club held their first ever dance film festival, which allowed our students to share their creativity and passion for dance with the rest of our community via UC Premiere. These activities are so imperative for our schools because it brings a great feeling of normalcy being able to do and share the things we love as well as the things that truly make us unique. Another super great thing happening here is the overwhelming support from all angles. Here at RTSA, we take mental health and well-being as our first priority. Weekly have we Weekly, we have yoga on Zoom led by our dance co-director, Ms. Hauser, as well as having clubs such as National Honor Society provide weekly tutoring for any students that are stuck in any subject and need a motivational push. This time of the year is definitely exciting and nerve-wracking. Seniors are hearing back from colleges, everyone is preparing for AP tests, and overall looking forward to the end of the spring semester. And of course, seniors' lives post-graduation. Conclusively, Renaissance High School for the Arts has been very busy. Although there is such a mix of excitement and hesitancy upon returning, ASB is ready and extremely prepared to welcome all students back with bright and smiley faces. We intend to make this moment truly special, especially with our freshmen and seniors. Our 2021 graduating class was not only among the first few classes to experience our newly renovated campus, but they were the last class to experience Renaissance at the Butler campus. Coming home for us has such a greater feeling because this home is a place we've truly molded as our own. With that being said, I can't wait for you to hear our future success. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Kira. It is so wonderful to have you here in person. Um, it's, been a, it's been a while since we've been able to meet in person, but to have um, one of our students in, in person, that's a, a very nice treat, actually. So did you mention that um, if you were a senior or? Uh, yes, I am a senior. Oh, okay. Um, Ms. Kerr, I, I know you're anxious to. Well, I was just gonna ask the question. Um, <laughs> you have been incredibly busy, it sounds like, and I have a feeling you had a hand in a lot of what you talked about happening on yeah. your campus. So thank you for your service to your students. You said it's an exciting and nerve wracking time, which means college acceptances are rolling in and that May 1st date is around yeah. the corner. Do you have any plans or ex I'm actually, news you just want to share? I'm mixed and in, very in between schools right now. I just got into UC Irvine, but um, thank you. I'm really looking forward to going to HBCU. So far, I've got accepted to two. <laughs> Dillard and Xavier so far, and I'm, hopefully I get into Howard. That is the school that I really do want to attend. So, yeah. <laughs> thank uh, you. Mr. Miller, did you have a... Oh yeah, um, shameless plug. I'm hosting a HBCU fair on March 27th and they may be doing uh, on-site, well, virtually accepted. So definitely feel free to attend. Definitely. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Dr. Benitez. Yeah, great job today. And uh, I'm particularly proud because Renaissance is the only high school in my uh, area. So <laughs> I will continue with those shameless plugs. Uh, Mr. Miller, you're not the only. So we had an opportunity uh, to have your principal uh, here with us yesterday, along with uh, one of your teachers, Mr. Tran, and then one of your uh, uh, leadership, someone on your leadership to Ms. Itson. Yeah. So I would encourage everyone, uh, there's some viral videos that are out there, including uh, one put together by Mr. Tran with some lyrics over Boys in the Hood in the background. Oh, I saw that, yeah. <laughs> Uh, but one of the things that stood out, and you're an example of it from what you shared, is um, the phoenix is going to rise out of this pandemic because of students like you. Uh, thank you. All right. So thank you uh, for being here today. And uh, check out those videos if anyone's watching. 
no problem. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Um, generally, uh, while we're meeting on Zoom, we let our student representatives know that uh, they don't have to spend the entire evening with us. Our board meetings have tended to go a little bit long. Uh, we're not on Zoom. You're here in person. But if you need to slip out. I'd love to stay. You'd love to stay. OK, well, we'd love to have you. But, but just know, if you have homework or something you need to tend to, we understand. But thank, thank you. you for being here. No problem. Pre Madam President, we have the level office from the high school uh, uh, here. <laughs> I'm sure he can arrange something. Already yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, next we have communications. Hi, my name is Judy Reynolds and I'm the, currently the school nurse at Buffum TLC as well as the Preschool Assessment Center um, assessing preschoolers that are potentially coming into our district as special education students. I think we have a really positive impact on the community. I think parents feel comfortable having a person there that's kind of watching out for their kid. It is our privilege to allow children to come to school when they have medical needs, emotional needs, you know, needs that need to be met during the day when their parents aren't with them, and to give them a safe place. We've been lucky in the district in that the district has released the nurses to help the Long Beach Health Department administer vaccines, not only to our own district personnel, but to the Long Beach community as well. On one of the days we had not only our mayor but Governor Gavin Newsom stop by to see how the Long Beach Health Department has been running the clinic which I must say has been phenomenal. The, the organization, the way they have not wasted any doses, we, they've been making them available to our teachers, our school staff so that we can get our children back to school and it was really nice to have that acknowledged by both our mayor and the governor of the state. In my particular job, I have three-year-olds that are coming in or, you know, they're just turning three, and a lot of them won't have, they aren't walking yet. No one has ever talked to the parent about, well, maybe the child needs a commercial stroller or a, a wheelchair to get to school. So we kind of help them to navigate, this is who you talk to, this is what you say, you know, those kind of things. And it, it's very powerful, and I think for parents to feel comfortable to have someone there that kind of assist them along the way. Well, thank you for that. Um, I know that Long Beach, uh, in Long Beach, we enjoy a good col a collaboration with the mayor. Uh, the mayor prioritized vaccinations for Long Beach Unified. And um, what's the number of Long Beach Unified employees that have been vaccinated so far? So we know at least 6,200 of our employees. Those are just the appointment links that we were able to send out on behalf of the health department. Um, and our estimates are that probably 700 to 1,000 more of our staff have been vaccinated through other means. But with the health department, 6,200 appointment links were used. Yeah, that's wonderful, especially you know, in um, paying attention to the news, that's just not happening. That's just not the case for other schools, school districts. So we are very fortunate to have that collaboration. Um, okay, next on the agenda, we have uh, public testimony on items listed on the agenda. So I imagine we, uh, yes, okay, we'll, we'll take care of that now. Tonya Reyes Uranga, 90806, speaking on items listed on the agenda. The first is item 23, business item personnel, human resource services classified and exempt, page five, abolishments, lack of work or lack of funds. Crazy title. Anyway, I'm, speak I'm trying to understand why Jordan High School in Megan's district will lose a college and career specialist. Avalon will lose a bilingual office assistant and why Hudson and Eric's area will lose a nutrition supervisor services supervisor. These three schools are, according to the great schools ranking, are below average achievement schools and need all the help they can get from the district. 
And while I have no reason to question the Hudson position, other than that's in a high, low-income area where families may be dependent on school for nutrition, I'm more concerned that Avalon will lose a language access personnel at a school that is primarily Latino and Spanish-speaking at a time when parents have many questions. It just doesn't make sense. But I'm very concerned at Jordan losing a college and career specialist. It is that if the dist- it's as if the district is giving up on the high school and will no longer invest in its staff and, and its students. There can be no justification in my eyes as there's never enough college advisors unless you are assuming Jordan students will not attend college. Item 24, other items, Williams UCP third quarter report. I was wondering how often do you provide parents and students with an orientation of their rights under the Williams settlement? It is important, yet there are no complaints and only one this quarter. I know that parents and students would benefit from yearly information regarding their rights under Williams. Item 26, new business resolution and equity policy. Your staff reports that the board directed staff to provide assessments for both the vacant and non-vacant properties to inform the board and enable it to make decisions regarding surplus and disposition options that are, quote, in the best interest of the district and community, unquote. I was wondering why there was not a community benefits clause in the resolution if, in fact, the options should be based on the best interest of the community. I'm especially concerned about the locations in zip code 90810 and 90813, as these areas can be even more severely impacted if the wrong business or agency buys the building. A community benefits clause could suggest at that whomever you selected as a buyer include mentions such as ethical contractor models, living wage, local hires, and environmental awareness with the hope that they would be good neighbors who keep surrounding areas clean and safe. These buildings are bought by public money, and as a responsible seller, the proceeds will be used to benefit the public, but their use should also not negatively impact the area but serve as a community benefit to the entire community. Last equity update, it has been eight months since the creation of the district equity equity leadership team. I have attended all but two school school board meetings, and in those eight months, I still do not know who is on the leadership team and what they're supposed to do. I look forward to a framework or an outline on who the team is and what they are charged with doing, and I look forward to any action and policy changes that they will recommend. Thank you for your time. My name is Nubia Flores Cedeno, and I'm calling on agenda item number 26 for Wednesday's evening school board meeting. I am a mother and a parent organizer learning every day. I will continue to do the work and will always identify people how they choose to be identified. I will always follow their lead. I am not disabled, I am an ally. My son is unable to express his choice right now, but until he can, I follow the lead of disability advocates, disabled disability advocates doing the work. What I have learned is that disability is the preferred language and using anything like special needs is marginalizing. Disability or disabled is not a bad word. What I have learned on my own journey as a mother and ally, if you're hesitant to use it, that is your ableism you need to address. Disability is a word to be used with pride and it is part of a person's identity. I want my son to be proud of who he is, all of him, his Latinx identity and his disability. When you present to the school board and the entire community that you are ready to address systemic marginalization of historically discriminated groups, What does it say to our children with their family and their families when you don't include ableism or people with disabilities? How are we centering students with disabilities? If at the top, as a mother and an ally, I don't see you using the correct language or even including in the rebuilding of these systems students with disabilities, what kind of hope can I have that it is spilling into meaningful action into the areas that make students with disabilities independent members of our society? Graduation rates testing, accessibility in schools, inclusion, services, supports, parent engagement. What about agency for our students with disabilities? It's all connected. How are you engaging black parents with children with disabilities? Are you making the IEP process language accessible for monolingual parents? Are you teaching about gender identity to students with disabilities? If we are rebuilding the house, let's make sure to rebuild it with everyone in mind. And lastly, my son has a right to a public school education like every student in this community. That's not special. He needs to eat, communicate, learn, have friends, and have hobbies. They're not different than anyone else. They're not special. He might need to access some of those elements differently, but they're not special. When you say special needs, you are marginalizing and minimizing. Words matter. Thank you. Public comment comment agenda item 26. Excellence in Equity in Curriculum and Instruction. My name is Shannon McCabe. I'm a parent of a second grader with a disability in 90814 
and a teacher at a middle school in 90804. The reopening of schools continues to highlight the imbalances in best practice within LBUSD schools, especially for students with disabilities and students of color. As a parent and a teacher who holds the tension of ableist and racial disparities, I feel like Atlas, who carries the weight of the world on his shoulders. The burden is too big for a god, much less a single parent and teacher. School closures opened my eyes to the lack of support given to students with disabilities. My daughter left school in March with her books and notebooks jammed into her backpack, but the pages were blank. Though her accommodations were clearly documented in her IEP, they hadn't been implemented with any integrity. I also became aware of the messaging she had been given. In Zoom class, she'd script her experiences in school. You are the worst student ever, she exclaimed. It has taken a year to turn her words from you deserve nothing to mom, I did it, I'm doing it. The inclusion resolution adopted by the board in February 2019 states, inclusive practices are not a separate component of education, but rather a core ideal at last that will be present in all our schools and all of our own district programs. If a core ideal, how does the district hold school sites accountable to ensure that inclusive best practices are being upheld? Who is responsible for dismantling ableist and racist practices in our schools? When will we believe and trust that all students can learn in any and all placements? As we reopen and return, the same prejudicial infrastructure and mindset seem to be present. The pandemic has been an opportunity to dig deep into the inherent structural inequities such as ableism and racism in our schools and not only reimagine all means all and equity everywhere as public policies and posts, but also practice it. Honest excellence in instruction is not an appropriation of data that paves a particular pathway. True excellence in instruction is the practice of presuming competence in all students in all places. Thank you. My name is Deacon McLean. I am calling regarding agenda item number 26. I am a former member, last chairperson of our city Citizens Advisory Commission on Disabilities. I sit on various other boards. I am a disability advocate. I also consider myself a change agent because my entire life I've dedicated to empowering, impacting, and educating around issues regarding education, bringing awareness when it comes to sharing about the lived experience as a person with a disability. This is a very, very important awareness and educational moment. Talking about this is at an early stage of kids' life is essential. And I honestly believe empowering and educating all children around disabilities. This will help cut down on bullying and kids not feeling alone and feeling like they feeling like they don't matter. I did not have this when I was mainstreamed into public school and at the time I was the only person with a disability and was bullied and had to take matters into my own hands. It was not a best choice, but I had to do what I had to do. And if I can help students with disabilities not go through what I went through, I am honored to lend my voice. I always say in my advocacy that I hope we reach a day where we people with disabilities are a before thought and not, not an afterthought. And nowhere is this more essential than centering our black students with disabilities. Are we making sure that we are not treating our black students with disabilities as second-class citizens? If you are discussing equity, are you looking at how black students with disabilities are assessing services, receiving supports, and graduating? I'm here to ask you, as you move forward with your work on equity in the school district, that you please, please make students with disabilities a before thought and not an afterthought. Thank you so much. Okay, um, that seems to be uh, all the public testimony on items listed on the agenda. And do we have public testimony on items not listed on the agenda? We'll go ahead and do that now. The 
Yes, my name is Craig Durfee, uh, property at 5431 East 29th Street with four grandkids. Uh, I would like to speak to the board regarding uh, my research on the issue of the recent uh, social press, a quote, uh, amid pandemic comma, quote, international, a quote, a child of pain. Uh, eight and 11 year olds are trying to commit suicide. And my website, uh, as a founder of Parents for the Rights of Developing Children, the DC that advertised Aaron Chaney Breeze, the Green Battery Rescue to each other, and help write AB 1718 Police Training for Autism in the year 2000, and then the Voice will eventually in LA Times, and the Voice will see in the register that I am concerned about the issues of our current state of education. Um, my website on the blog will offer uh, suggestions based on medical research. They have, say, uh, echo psychologists for outdoors, which helps reduce 50%. And without the app, app, uh, green space, Denmark study, when they grow up, at least amount of green space, increases 55% of psychiatry disorders. That we have to understand uh, that technology is causing uh, a brain to go in a form of um, a state of shock, in a sense, and addiction. And uh, also the fact that the Blue Light SR73, Dr. Pam, now Blue Light Summit, it's causing not only nearsightedness, but sleep deprivation, that these are the things, a sample of my uh, concerns is that I would like to see your public record act form be uh, up front uh, so everybody can find it, and to uh, the phone numbers and stuff where public information as to when to contact you for a board meeting is very simple up front. Um, and realize that... Um, uh, AB 2417, which is our goal, seal civic engagement, um, it is something, I don't know if you're aware or not, but it is a form of mental therapy because they will be less ad addicted to technology and be uh, developing their career and also helping the community. Uh, bike riding is considered one of those great uh, tools for mental therapy. And uh, it's called Palo Alto Safe Route to School if you want to watch the video for two minutes, the PTA at Cupuccino. And it reduces fatalities by up to 40% in terms of the requirement of our state and federal to reduce fatalities. So there is a series of things on my website that I have achieved. And I just did an Orange County master plan, well, my writing letters for Safe Route School. And it was my project. I just did a $200 million uh, bike quarter, we named it Congressional of Honor, Bike and Production Trail. So I like to offer my services for free to the board and show my research so you can benefit for your restoration. Uh, my name is Brian Hannon. I uh, called in uh, last Tuesday, and the issue is regarding grades. I wanted to follow up on that. This is a comment that I believe is item not on the agenda. Um, I just want to know what the school district, uh, what district staff and the board of Yes, my name is Craig Durfee, uh, property at 5431 East 39th Street, with four grandkids. Uh, I would like to speak to the board regarding uh, my restoration. My name is Brian Hannon. I uh, called in uh, last Tuesday. And the issue is regarding grades. I wanted to follow up on that. This is a comment that I believe is item not on the agenda. Um, I just want to know what the school district, uh, what district staff and the Board of Education is doing about the uh, increase in fail and degrades on the fall semester report card for students in grades 6 through 12. Uh, according to the district's own data, 27% uh, <clears throat> of the um, of the students in grades six through twelve were issued a D or fail on their final semester report card. Uh, this is especially troubling for high school students that depend on uh, decent grades for college admission. Uh, this is a double digit increase from the previous year. Uh, previously, in January of 2020, uh, 14 percent of the students received a D or fail on their final semester fall report card. Now it's 27%. Uh, there's about 70,000 students in Long Beach Unified. I suspect there's about 35,000 
which is about half in grades 6 through 12, um, 27% of 35,000 would be about 9,500 students that are receiving a D or a fail on their report card, um, compared to about 4,700 students from just the year before. I think we can surmise that distance learning, the school closure, is responsible for most of this. Uh, students are struggling with isolationism, depression, uh, internet con connectivity issues. Um, how can we in good conscience continue to issue Ds and fails to students who are having these issues and who would not normally be receiving a D or fail if they were going to school in person? I sincerely hope the board and district staff addresses this issue at some point because I have not um, heard this issue addressed at all. Thank you. Tonya Reyes Uranga, 90806. I have comments not listed on the agenda. First, LBUSD workshop on Tuesday. I want to give a big virtual hug to Tuesday's presenters from uh, Dooley and Stevens Middle School. Nicole and Megan both need to be on your curriculum equity team. They get it. Special shout out to Nicole, you're in my prayers. I hope that equity is not a topic just for students of color, but that schools with majority white students also benefit from the great curriculum that Nicole and Megan presented. But after listening to the equity audit and training update later that day, I'm still trying to figure out what exactly you're trying to do and how long it will take. A staff member stated it was one of the goals of the equity plan. What are the others? Second item, board 700 filings. As of yesterday, three incumbent board members have statements of economic interest available on the district site, but they are for 2018 and none for 2019 or 2020. This is the yearly reporting mandate, isn't it? The two new board members also have their 700s on the site, but I assume they are for year 2020. I believe that having the updated 700s on file will provide more transparency to the public in addition to providing some framework for the abstentions when made. Third, and most important, I want us to talk about retaliation against parents who are vocal. I hope that soon you address the issue of retaliation and inequitable treatment by school principals and staff when a parent speaks out. I know when I ran for school board, I was warned by a board member not to criticize the district. Not sure if asking questions, stating facts that others may disagree with, or providing information regarding perceptions of parents, students, and community members is considered being critical to the district, but apparently it is. Just this past week, I have had three calls from parents, one a special ed parent and others grammar school parents who have stated that they have felt that they have been alienated since they spoke out or met with their principals and teachers. These actions resulted in negative feedback and effects saying their child was a liar or being untruthful. One mother said she felt as if her principals and teachers attitude changed and they stopped communicating when she became more involved and more vocal about her child and other children's educational outcome. Yesterday, a presenter stated in the curriculum equity update that where there is unfairness and injustice, we're going to do something about it. So all I ask is that you and your staff and teachers listen to parents without assigning motive, do not get defensive, and seek first to understand, then work to do something about it. Those are the values you espouse. They need to be put into practice. Can someone detail what options parents actually have when a principal has shifted gears in communication? I couldn't think of anything to tell them other than that they're not alone and that public sharing and persistence will prevail. I will add, when there is unfairness and injustice, the school district is going to do something about it. I hope you do. Thanks. My name is Heidi Stoika. I'm speaking on a subject that's not on the agenda for the March 17th board meeting. Dear board members and executive staff, I'm speaking to you as both a parent with a child in the district and as a school psychologist. I've been blessed to work with many dedicated school staff and administrators at Long Beach Unified for over 20 years. I'm so proud that our district has put equity, social emotional learning, and mental health wellness as a top priority, especially during these extremely challenging times. Long Beach Unified is often on the cutting edge of best practice, and our family resource centers are an excellent step in the right direction. They're a necessary and important resource to many of our families, but provide direct service to only about 26 of our 85 schools about a third of our schools. The remaining two thirds rely on school counselors and school psychologists to provide check-ins, brief solution-focused counseling support, referrals to community agencies, and crisis intervention to help prevent a, a student from suicide or from harming others. School psychologists can help support and implement culturally responsive behavioral and mental health 
services. Over the years, I've seen our numbers of school psychologists dwindle to only about 50 in a district of 70,000 students. Many of us school psychologists are in three or more schools, and some of our high school psychologists serve about 4,000 students. Our professional organization recommends a ratio of only 700 students to school psychologists so that there is adequate time to provide mental health prevention and intervention supports. Conducting special education evaluations easily consumes a majority of our time and pulls us away from directly serving our students. I worry that we school psychologists are stretched so thin that it's nearly impossible for us to do the wellness outreach and check-in supports that our students and families so desperately need. I fear that we may miss a student in crisis and may not be able to prevent a future tragedy. Please hire more school psychologists so that we may be able to more fully help our students. Our students and teachers are depending on us. Hello, um, happy St. Patrick's Day. My name is Darlene Sperry, and um, my student is a junior at Wilson High School. I am calling today because I am very concerned about the district's reopening plan. Our um, community is already in the red tier and soon going into the orange tier as, as per the news today. And we are still not back at school, and my son still needs to wait until April 26, which is more than a month away, and has been away from the site for more than a year. The children are hurting, and I really don't think that this board, nor the superintendent or the deputy superintendent who have made these plans for reopening have really had the heart of the kids in mind when they have made this wait for to be so long. It is not right. I urge you to rethink this and to be transparent, not to tell us we're opening, then we're closing, then we're opening. No, then we can't come back. I urge you to be honest about it because we have other choices as parents. Uh, and we like to know now when the opening date is even for next year. I urge you to open the schools now, not later. As the assistant superintendent of the high school told the PTA at Wilson High School, that once they're open, they're not going to close again. So why are you waiting another month? Are you are uh, that seems to me not to be a really reasonable uh, decision because who knows what could happen in a month? Let's get the kids back in school and follow CDC guidelines and do what's right for the kids, not what's right for the adults in the school district. This is just not fair. Thank you, and I really do wish you a happy St. Patrick's Day and put your decision-making in the hands of the kids and in the best interest of the kids. Thank you. Bye-bye. Hello, this is Eric Larson, school employee. I'm addressing the reopening of schools. I left a message at the last board meeting, and I just wanted to essentially reiterate two points, the first being that I'm sure that the board and uh, administration is aware that because this COVID test is on emergency youth use authorization that it can't be mandated in any circumstance or form whatsoever, and that the district is obligated to inform both employees and families that they do have the option to decline this test and still participate in uh, in-person learning. And point number two, I think that as a community, particularly when it comes to asymptomatic testing, i.e the necessity to take a test to prove that you're well when you're not sick, we should really, as a community, I think, think of what kind of a message that we are sending to our, our students. And does that align with the district's purported focus and emphasis on social and emotional health? I think that it's time that as a community, we start talking about what health really is. Thank you so much. March 17th board meeting, 5 p.m. Item reopening plans. Rebecca and Stephen Stack, property owner, 3738 Sebrin Avenue, Long Beach 90808. Parents of a ninth grader at Millican, fifth grader at Urcham. The upper grades need to open in person now. Late April is too late. It's more imperative for our high schooler to return than our fifth grader. If moving around campus is the issue, 
then simply drop some of some of the electives. For example, my son does not actually need Spanish or game design. Long Beach Unified has failed our family. We are considering private schools for next year. Do the right thing. Make your priority reopening now. Hello, my name is Danielle Sees. I'm speaking on agenda item 21. Um, I'm calling in regards to the reopening of schools in Long Beach Unified, particularly pertaining to high schools um, with the opening date for freshmen, sophomores, and juniors not being until April 26th. LA County is already in the red tier, which allows schools to reopen and will most likely be in the orange tier at the very beginning of April. I feel it is unacceptable to wait until April 26th and continue to allow the students who are suffering with distance learning to continue their suffering by being stranded at home and continue distance learning. Students need to be back in the classroom, interacting with their peers, meeting their teachers, and they need to do it now because it is safe based on science, based on data, based on the CDC recommendations, and based on our current tier. I beg the board to reconsider the opening date and move it up. Move it up. Get our high schoolers back in school right after spring break, the Monday after spring break, back in school. This needs to happen for their mental health, for their academic health, and for the overall benefit of our community. Thank you. Glenn Perez. Uh, my name is Glenn Perez, and I'm speaking here on the uh, pandemic relief budget and reopening of schools for the for the Wednesday, March 17th, 2021 session. Good afternoon, Superintendent Baker and members of the board. My name is Glenn Perez, and I'm a junior at Lakewood High School. I also sit on the superintendent's advisory committee. Furthermore, I am also a youth organizer with Californians for Justice. Over the last couple of weeks, I've given lots of thought on, on whether to choose the hybrid model, and I've decided that it's not the best option for me. We have all heard of the increased amount of, of, of responsibilities that young people have had to shoulder as a result of the stressors placed on families due to the pandemic. I too have found myself with more responsibilities, and in-person learning would increase my level of stress because I would now have to consider transportation and the level of anxiety that I would have to navigate as a result of coming in close contact with people who I'm not familiar with or have not been around for over a year. At home, I've established a, I've established a routine where I'm able to take breaks to take care of myself, and I don't have to worry about following strict safety protocols or the possibility of infection. And I also think about some of my friends who have been taking on the task of supporting their family with childcare and how they might not have the option of, of going back to in-person learning, or youth who have taken on employment in order to fill the gaps. Moving on, what we need now more than ever is an opportunity for not only students, but teachers and staff to heal with a restorative restart plan in April, over the summer, and at the beginning of, of the 2021-2022 school year, where everyone is provided the space and time to prioritize mental health and wellness for the whole community. We've all experienced a lot of change and trauma in the past 12 plus months and school sites can and need to provide additional supports for black students, students of color, low income and special needs students who are among the most impacted and vulnerable. We all deserve an opportunity to slow down from academics and rebuild and rebuild relationships. If we center student, family and educator relationships and voice we can build a strong foundation now and into the future to ensure a well and stable school community. The hybrid model cannot guarantee a renewed motivation for students, but a restorative restart can. We simply can't return to normal. Normal is a standard that has been long neglected black and brown students in, in our schools. Our bar must be higher as we reimagine how our schools and classrooms can be places for California students, students to thrive. I ask that you consider all that has been lost over the past year and imagine all that can be gained by prioritizing relationships. Hi, I'm Michelle Liu, and I'm calling regarding article number or item number 21. Um, 
regarding the schools reopening. And as of today, the county and state state that it's okay for schools K through 12 to open. So if that's the case, why the holdup? Why are schools that are beyond second grade being put off until the end of April? It makes zero sense, especially for those seniors who have missed out on a huge portion of their junior year and so far their entire senior year so far. And it seems that there's another agenda that has nothing to do with the students. It's keeping the students out of school. It makes zero sense. The district is not putting the students first. And the students that are also very high functioning but have special needs are hugely impacted as well. They are not getting the services or any assistance uh, one-on-one that can be done in a classroom setting that may help them. So a lot of those students are falling way behind. And they assume that students that have attention issues like ADHD or ADD um, are having an even harder time. They cannot sit through hours and hours and hours of Zoom lessons. So it's ridiculous that the district is putting off getting these kids back in school. Please push up and get the schools, the high schools, to push up the reopening date and get the students on campus. Thank you. Good afternoon, Superintendent Baker and the board. I am Megan Lane, a junior at Long Beach Poly High School, and I sit on the Superintendent Student Advisory Committee. I'm also a youth organizer and an intern at Californians for Justice. I'm here today to speak on the COVID relief funds for Wednesday, March 17th, 2021's board meeting. This pandemic has not hit all families equally. Black and brown communities have been hit the hardest, and returning back to school needs to account for this reality. As a result, to not, as a result I've chosen not to return to in-person learning. In short, in the result of the pandemic, I have experienced an increase in social anxiety, and it is hard for me to go inside grocery stores or places with a lot of people. And I am choosing to prioritize my mental health and overall well-being. As a result of the pandemic, I also found myself more reflective and critical with my family and friends, talking and discussing the well-being of Black youth. To be completely honest, Black students do not feel a sense of belonging in our schools. And black, black students and families often find educational attainment elusive and unattainable. Historically, black students and families have not had a seat at the table. And although we applaud our districts in its efforts to rewrite history, we need to ensure that our voices are heard when it's time to prioritize funds in an equitable manner. We are at a time where students' motivation is at an all-time low. Students' participation over Zoom is almost non-existent. And we don't know if students are present when the majority of our students' cameras are off due to child care and other extenuating circumstances. Giving students a seat at the table will inspire students to speak up more and co-design a successful future for all students. If we prioritize these funds to ensure LBUSD has a racially just curriculum, teachers that are trained on racial justice, and students that have access to culturally relevant support, such as Black Achievement Programs. We can ensure that students and our families feel a sense of belonging. We need a courageous collaborative, we need courageous and collaborative leadership at this moment. There's a lot of pressure on the district and teachers, but there's also a lot of pressure on our students and families. We want to ensure and invite students to thrive in a caring environment. But to get there, we need student voices to be valued and reflected on in school policies. We look forward to working with the district's leadership to rebuild, reimagine a racially just education system. Thank you. Good afternoon, Superintendent Baker and members of the board. My name is Omar Cardenas. I am a father of a fifth grade special needs student, a resident of the Poly High School Neighborhood District, and the lead organizer with Californians for Justice. I'm here today to speak on the historical importance of our district's history. 
and the additional COVID relief dollars the district will be receiving uh, for this meeting today, March 17, 2021. The pandemic has been a flashpoint for our communities to re-examine the role our schools serve. We've seen anew how schools are at the heart of our communities, serving as distribution centers for food, supplies, health resources, and information. And we know that students across the state have seen the traditional forms of learning disrupted, but have adapted and are taking on new roles in their homes and communities where they are doing meaningful learning. For example, many low black and brown students have taken on the role of caretakers for siblings, elders, even parents who have been left vulnerable by the pandemic. Students have also been placed in a position as providers, working as essential personnel in grocery stores or even food retail. On top of these new responsibilities, students also had to navigate life in a global pandemic, the consequences of which have taken a tremendous toll on mental health and socialization in our communities. Though through this all, students are juggling digital learning, identifying best practices, and supplement, supplementing tutoring and other traditional classroom supports with peer-to-peer -peer outreach. We must reimagine and rebuild our schools as institutions our youth deserve. For years, stakeholders locally and nationally have advocated for a transformative community school model that see and serve the whole child we must not overlook the opportunity to bring the collective vision and needs and values our communities deserve to reality. As a father, it is heartbreaking to hear my son tell me that he does not want to go back to in-person learning. It is heartbreaking because I know the challenges he has had to navigate since TK of having to navigate social contracts that do not fit his way of being or knowing. I think about what it would take for him to reintegrate into the school community, and I know that it would be weeks, if not months, for him to be able to adapt again in assuming that he is giving ample opportunity to build meaningful connections with his peers and staff. We need to move beyond traditional metrics and standards of success and reimagine new structures and metrics that value and uplift the whole child. With the state COVID relief, um, and now recently approved federal stimulus package, LBUSD funds will nearly double. We can make critical investments in the needs of students. And it's important that the district maximize this opportunity to one, steward teacher and students, as well as navigate the impact the pandemic. Thank you. Um, that's all for our public testimony on items not listed on the agenda. Um, Dr. Baker, did you have something? Thank to you. I just wanted to make a point of clarification. There were some statements about the Statement of Economic Interest, Form 700. And I just wanted to make it clear on behalf of the Board of Education that those forms are due to the Board Secretary, Letitia Rodriguez, on April 1st, 2021, and due to the County Office from Letitia by April 8th, 2021. So just wanted to make that known to the public. Yeah. Thank you for that <clears throat> clarification. Um, Mr. Otto? Yeah, and just to be even a little further clear on that, um, uh, it was said that the new board members hadn't filed theirs yet. In fact, the rules are that if you were sworn in in the last couple of months of 2020, that that filing uh, takes the place of a April 1st filing, so both Eric and I are compliant, and I've checked that out with um, the Registrar of Voters, and so we, we are in compliant. I didn't want anybody to be misled into thinking that we were not. Thank you. Okay, next on the agenda, we have a staff report, but we have none, and that takes us to business items. So personnel, Mr. Miller. Yes, thank you. On behalf of the Human Resource <coughs> Service Office, I present the following proposed actions prepared by Assistant Superintendent of Human Resource Services, approved and recommended by the superintendent. First, the classified and exempt personnel. Appointments, 24. Leaves of absence, 28. Abandonments of position, 22. I mean, two. Resignations, nine. Retirements, nine. Now to certificated personnel. Appointments, 37 and service changes, two. Leaves of absence, 16. Separations are deceased, one. Resignations, seven. Retirements, 19. And amendments, one. That will conclude the human resource report. Move approval. 
Second. Discussion. All Madam, in favor? Madam Chair. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Discussion. Yes. Yeah, I just Dr. wanted to Chair. highlight that um, during our board workshop, we received a presentation on, um, on on our commitment to diversity through our hire. So, I encourage our community members to check out um, uh, our board workshop. It, it um, actually, Mr. Itson, is that available already on online? Uh, is our uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. A week, ten days, two weeks. Okay. Um, so, cor correction: when they become available, uh, I would encourage our community members um, to um, view, uh, of course, all of it. But that there's a specific part of our board workshop that highlights um, the work that we're doing around diversity and the commitment that we're trying to uphold through um, our employment uh, opportunities. Uh, yes, Ms. Kerr. So we're starting to see, as we do often this time of year, an increase in retirements, and I see some very uh, some names that are very near and dear to my heart in terms of my own kids' education here in Long Beach Unified. And in the past years, we've been able to see some of our teachers who are retiring have been able to come before that and wondering if there's plans with the staff or uh, media services to help us see them potentially in a different way this year and honor. Um, those who choose to be honored it's something we can offer to them yeah thank you i was going to, going to note that nine of the certificated personnel on this report have more than 30 years of, are retiring with more than 30 years of service and one with 41 years of service and christine quickly yeah that's incredible uh okay so we will do a roll call vote all in favor of dr benitez aye Ms. Kerr? Aye. Mr. Otto? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And I vote aye. So hearing no um, opposition or abstentions, that passes 5-0. Um, instruction report. Move approval. Second. Discussion? All in favor, Dr. Benitez? Aye. Ms. Kerr? Aye. Mr. Otto? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And I vote aye. So hearing no opposed or abstentions, that passes 5-0. Finance report A. I move to approve. Second. Discussion? All in favor, Dr. Benitez? Aye. Ms. Kerr? Aye. Mr. Otto? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. I vote aye. Hearing no opposed or abstentions, passes 5-0. Finance report B. Move to approve. Second. Discussion? Yes, Madam Chair, I recuse myself from participation in finance report B on the consent calendar. I have a potential financial interest under government code 1091 and 87100. My husband works for a subcontractor who has done work for the payees. Uh, any further discussion? All in favor? Dr. Benitez? Aye. Mr. Otto? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And I vote aye. So hearing no opposed, but one abstention, that passes 4-1. Uh, business department report. Move approval. Second. Discussion? Mr. Otto? Yeah, <clears throat> I would just note that Long Beach Pride has provided not just 63,600 bottles of hand sanitizer for us with a market value of $195,000, but more than that, because it's my understanding that when the three semis pulled up, uh, there was a fourth one. <clears throat> and uh, so we're very, very thankful that uh, uh, of this contribution that, that they've made. <clears throat> Habitat for Humanity has also provided $30,000 for the purchase and installation of a new marquee. And uh, these, these are uh, gifts that are provided to the district for people that believe in the work that we do. And I just wanted to personally recognize those two. There are many more. Yes, thank you for uh, pointing that out. Dr. Benitez? Ditto, well, Mr. Otto uh, <laughs> said, uh, and, and, and those hand sanitizers will go out to all of our schools uh, and students. Yeah, that's wonderful. 
Okay, any further discussion? All in favor? Dr. Benitez? Aye. Ms. Kerr? Aye. Mr. Otto? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And I vote aye. So hearing no opposition, no abstentions, that passes 5-0. Purchasing and contracts report A. Move approval. Second. Discussion? All in favor, Dr. Benitez? Aye. Ms. Kerr? Aye. Mr. Otto? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And I vote aye. So hearing no opposition, no abstentions, that passes 5-0. Purchasing and contracts report B. Move, Move to approval. approval. Second. Discussion? Yes, Madam Chair, I recuse myself from participation in purchasing contracts report B on the consent calendar. <clears throat> I have a potential financial interest under government code 1091 and 87100. My husband works for a subcontractor who has done work for the awardees. Uh, further discussion? <clears throat> yeah, ju just briefly, um, I want everybody to know, and you probably already do, that we go over these before uh, the board meeting and ask questions and uh, the fact that we're not having a lengthy discussion on them as to your benefit. It means that we've had all of our questions uh, answered, that uh, we're confident that, uh, that the um, purchasing and contract reports, in fact, all the business reports uh, are, uh, are solid and, uh, and good for the district, and that's why they move so quickly. Thank you. Any further discussion? Uh, Madam President, are we on uh, report A or B right now? B. Okay. No, no, no further discussion. Okay. Any further discussion? All right. All in favor, Dr. Benitez? Aye. Ms. Kerr? Oh, sorry. Mr. Otto? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And I vote aye. So that passes 4 0 with one abstention. Okay. Now we are at superintendent items. Dr. Baker. Sure, the first item is an information item to accept the Williams UCP third quarterly report that has been reported. There was one instructional material complaint that was resolved, and so this is the quarterly report. The second item is I have two administrative assignments to present tonight for approval. The first is for Angel Mikaele, a teacher at Dooley Elementary School to move to the acting assistant principal at Dooley Elementary School, effective on the dates noted. And at the middle K-8 school level, Jennifer Kolb to move from teacher on special assignment at Jefferson to acting assistant principal at Franklin for the duration of the school year on the dates noted. Move approval. Second. Uh, discussion? All in favor, Dr. Benitez? Aye. Ms. Kerr? Aye. Mr. Otto? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And I vote aye. So hearing no opposition or abstentions, that passes 5-0. Unfinished business, we have none. Um, new business, the board meeting schedule. Move approval. Second. Discussion? All in favor, Dr. Benitez? Aye. Ms. Kerr? Aye. Mr. Otto? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And I vote aye. So hearing no opposition, no abstentions, that passes 5-0. 2021-2022 so schedule of board meetings and workshops. Move approval. Second. Discussion? Just a question. Does this include the moving of the May 5th uh, scheduled meeting to the 28th of uh, April? That was the item prior. Oh. Yeah, it, okay. it was by itself. That was in the meeting schedule. Okay. Yes. Uh, Ms. Kerr? Um, yeah, I just wanted to make note. Uh, we have one meeting in July uh, per city the city charter. charter. Um, August 18th is combined with a workshop on the 17th and 18th. And Traditionally, we have two meetings in September, and I'm assuming that we have one meeting in September because of the Labor Day weekend. So we're holding that if we need to add a meeting in September, it falls that week falls right around the opening of school. And so if we have business that we need to hold a meeting, we will ask you to approve an additional meeting. But at this time, we anticipate being able to cover business with the August 18th meeting. 
Thank you. Any further discussion? All in favor, Dr. Benitez? Aye. Ms. Kerr? Aye. Mr. Otto? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And I vote aye. So hearing no opposition or abstentions, that passes 5-0. Resolution 031721-A to declare 999 Atlantic Avenue, Long Beach, California, 90813. 4310 Long Beach Boulevard, Long Beach, California, 90807, and 1515 and 1511 Hughes Way, Long Beach, California, 90810, surplus property, and to make priority offerings pursuant to Education Section 17464. So that's an information item. Um, mm -hmm. Do we have somebody who's going to speak to that? Oh, you, me, you can. Oh, sure. Uh, we, we very much appreciate the discussion this morning regarding this item. And so I'll have Alan Rising come up, quickly recap the recommendation, and um, invite discussion amongst the board uh, to the extent that you'd like to further discuss this item and give us things to consider as we move forward. Hello, good afternoon, Madam President, board members, staff, and community. Uh, the item, the information item that we're presenting for you tonight is a follow-up to the, to the discussion we had today at our, our board workshop uh, related to surplus properties that we have in our school district. These are, uh, for, for information, these are non-school site, non-educational properties. These are support facilities that the district has had for many years in support of our school uh, operations. Uh, we've done some analysis on this property and today we had a, a, a great discussion with the board about potential uses for those properties and potential future dispositions of those properties. Uh, we're presenting uh, information today related to the physical makeup and when we receive those properties and what some of our uh, estimates of the valuation of those properties are, uh, at least just prior to COVID. Uh, at this point, uh, at, the, at the board's wishes, we'll, we'll come back and we'll be bringing more information back to the board in future uh, meetings to talk about options that the board may have and flexibility to, that the board may have within law uh, related to how we may want to handle those properties and some of the uh, uses, the final uses of those properties as we go, in, go forward. So uh, at this point, I'm available if there's any further questions uh, about this, but uh, we will be bringing more information forward at future meetings. Uh, Ms. Kerr? Sure, thank you, uh, Mr. Rising. Um, and thank you to my colleagues for uh, making an amendment to the agenda to allow more discussion on this. Um, is, um, for the public who didn't tune in today and who may only have access to this video, I think sometimes the videos are there for about 12 or 14 hours on YouTube before they pull them for, for captioning. So if someone wants to catch something, they should catch it quickly. Um, this packet of information regarding these properties that has the date acquired, the value, what they're used for and not used for. Is this available on the website currently for folks to look at? It, it is. We, we can post that information available for the community so that they can uh, look at which properties. Uh, if you'd like to, I can quickly do a quick uh, review of which properties that we're referring to, but we can make that, uh, that information available for the community uh, on our website. Yeah, I think that would be helpful. I know it's not a necessarily a fresh conversation for those of us in the room, but if you could give us kind of a brief rundown of what those properties are, sure. what they are used for, not used for, um, and what the intention can be, potentially. Absolutely. So the, there, there are uh, seven properties that we're actually looking at at this point. These, again, are non-educational facilities. They're support facilities that house various different operations in the district in support of our educational goals. Uh, the first one is 999 Atlantic. Uh, this is a currently a vacant property that was previously used for our personnel commission and some of our uh, Major K bond uh, program uh, uh, activities. That, pro that property has, is currently vacant and has been vacant for several years. Uh, we're also talking about 4310 Long Beach Boulevard. Uh, this we, we affectionately in Long Beach call that the Willows Building. Uh, this building uh, was previously used for our special education administrative offices as well as uh, for a short period of time our uh, Office of Media Services, which we now call uh, Marketing and Media Services, was housed there as well. 
Uh, the property is currently vacant. Uh, it's not suitable for educational purposes and, and uh, really at this point is, uh, is surplus to, to most of our needs. Uh, the other property that we're, that we're focusing on is our administrative offices, which is 1515 Hughes Way. Uh, we're looking closely at that property, even though it's being used and it is the center of our administrative offices, uh, to be able to uh, relocate that building, relocate those functions to a, more, a location that's more suitable for community access, to improve access for uh, individuals that may need uh, transportation corridors and other things to be able to get to, get to that building. Uh, we also are looking at a small piece of property near Ora Peza Elementary School. It's a parking lot. Uh, the address is uh, 73, uh, 723 Long Beach Boulevard. Uh, it's immediately adjacent to Ora Peza. It's currently an open air parking lot that has about 25 parking stalls. Uh, we're looking at that as, as whether or not we, we need to retain that uh, parking facility for the school or if there's some other needs and other uses for that location. Uh, the fifth one is 2201 East Market Street. That is currently our district's warehousing operations as well as our uh, procurement operations. Our purchasing folks work from that facility. Uh, we currently use that for our, for our warehousing, warehousing operations and we were exploring whether or not that's the best in, uh, use for that property or whether we should look for another location for uh, the use. Uh, the, the sixth property is 2425 Webster Avenue in Long Beach. This is uh, the location for our facilities division as well as our maintenance and our operations teams are housed out of that location. Uh, the concern there is due to the location of that property on the westerly border, whether we could look for another piece of land that would be uh, more suitable to uh, service uh, all of our district uh, across the district and be, be a more accessible location. The last property we're looking at is 2700 Pine Avenue. This is the location of our transportation division. This is our, our uh, fleet garage as well as our transportation services is housed out of that unit and we're looking at that property to see if there's a better location for it to be able to service more effectively uh, the needs of our district. So that's a kind of a quick rundown of the properties that we're looking at today. And Mr. Sure. Rise, oh sorry, go ahead, Megan. Were you gonna follow up? Yeah. No, sure. that we'll just just very, very quickly, um, <clears throat> yeah. when we say that a property is not suitable for educational purposes, what we mean is classroom purposes because in 1933, when Long Beach had an earthquake, we passed the Field Act, which was the strongest earthquake uh, legislation uh, in the state of California at the time. And what that means is that if any of these seven facilities were to be contemplated for educational use, meaning classroom use, they would have to be completely redone at a probably yes. cost that are prohibitive. And uh, that's what not suitable for educational use means. So yes, just th thank you for that clarification. Let's go a little deeper into that. According to state law in California, directly as a result of the 1933 Long Beach earthquake, they, they uh, passed the Field Act, which requires all school buildings, buildings that we would house either teachers or students in, to meet a set of building standards, uh, structural safety standards as well as fire code standards uh, and, and accessibility standards as well. And uh, for us to use one of these buildings, it would require a significant rebuild and reinforcement and strengthening. Uh, typically that is uh, outside of feasibility just due to the amount of work that we required to bring these facilities up. Uh, our asset advisory committee looked at that and, and looked at our long-term projections for student growth or in this case student, student uh, population reductions and realized that we just didn't need those properties to be able to properly and adequately house the students that we forecast. Uh, Dr. Benitez. Yeah, and just to uh, follow up on what uh, Board Member Kerr expressed for folks that weren't able to view earlier today um, and are hearing this for the first time, so um, the information that we requested to be uh, brought back, and hence this being an information item, um, were clarity around what the recommendation included in terms of options. Uh, number two, um, what clarity around what we're required to do by law uh, as a board in, in terms of the, the properties themselves, and pr in particular three uh, of the properties. And then the last, uh, more information around um, community benefits uh, options. 
um, with that recommendation. So just wanted to, to share that that was the reason that we changed it into an information item so that we could be provided more information and clarity around the recommendation itself. Yes, thank you. Uh -huh. that, that'd be the information we'd be bringing back to the board. Thank you, uh, Ms. Kerr. Yes, thank you uh, for the clarification, Dr. Benitez. Um, I was, I was gonna say the same thing. Um, so it, it isn't necessarily a pulling of the item or a discount of the work that's been done, but asking for, again, those further clarifications, um, especially around community benefit. And one of the things that I said this afternoon is we are the, you know, acknowledging we're the largest landholder in the city of Long Beach and that parcels like this um, will never be available again in the city of Long Beach and that we do some long-term thinking, again, within the confines of what we're legally required to do um, and what we need to do, but that align with the vision and the values of our community, potentially for a, a non-traditional either waiver or use of some of those um, properties as we look to, to quote unquote dispose of them. So thank you for taking the time and I look forward to us continuing the conversation. I also acknowledge that in order for us to have some of those conversations, we have to pass a resolution to get to the next step. So it isn't just a conversation around vision and values. It is if we even want to have some of those conversations, there's a mechanism by which that happens and that's passing the resolution to start the process. Um, so I appreciate that we had a long discussion this afternoon and that we're acknowledging that this is the start of a conversation, um, but that we do need to, to make movement on this. We can't keep talking about it necessarily because in order to even deepen the conversation with potential partners, we have, we have to pass a resolution. So thank you for your patience and indulging. Um, I will speak for me. My uh, desire and need for more information around how the conversation continues. Um, I think that was it. Little fun fact, we just hit the 88th anniversary of the Long Beach, 88 year anniversary of the Long Beach quake and we got a shout out on Twitter from Dr. Lucy Jones and for me as a kid growing up in earthquake country, she was that person who when she came on TV, I knew everything was gonna be okay because she was gonna explain how I was safe. So I thought that was pretty fun this week. <laughs> um, thank you. I would just like to add that um, as we're thinking about this resolution, that we also think about the properties that are deemed surplus that are costing us money that are vacant, um, it's, it's costing us money every year, and if, if maybe we have the flexibility to treat those properties separate than the other properties that are currently occupied. I, I don't know if um, that was, uh, you know, if that could be a consideration. Um, also, another small point, um, the property that's adjacent to Oropesa, which is parking for staff, if you could address, you know, maybe at a later date or whatever, um, what alternatives we have for parking for staff, since that's a very impacted area. I, I anticipate that would be a question um, coming to us. If, you're, if we're eliminating 25 parking spots, what are we offering uh, in exchange for that? Um, does anybody else have any further discussion or any more questions? Mr. Rising, no? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Wow, okay, we're at report of board members already. Uh, I'm sorry? Did I just pass over a whole? <laughs> I was doing so oh. good, I thought it's not dark yet, I didn't know what to do with myself. Um, I'm sorry, Dr. Brown. No um, apology the, needed. I'm, I know, so unequitable. I'm okay. unmasked and ready. Unmasked and ready. I see. Thank I didn't recognize you without, <laughs> without a, mask. a mask. Thank you for the opportunity. I'm honored to share that last week on March 10th, we had a convening of our student equity leadership team. So that's the student leadership voice around equity. And in that meeting, it was an impactful 90 minutes. We were joined by our colleagues led by Dr. Kale and the Office of Curriculum Instruction Professional Development as a part of their equity curriculum audit. The group came to the students in focus group format to gather information about the experience that students have had with our curriculum, changes that they would like to recommend, and just a healthy conversation about how we can make curriculum se selection 
that honors all of our students and make changes from the ways that we've always done it to the ways that we want to be going forward. And so I wanted to highlight that in the same meeting, the students also had opportunity to share with myself and with uh, Mr. Edward Samuels, the director of high schools who was present, some of the input that they wanted us to hear from a student lens to adults in planning for what we need to do to be completely supportive of welcoming students back to our campuses in person and what we can do to be supportive of honoring students who will be remaining virtual in that time. And so at the end of the meeting, I celebrated the students and said, wow, in this meeting, you gave direct feedback to the assistant superintendent who leads the curriculum equity audit. You gave direct feedback to the director of, of the high school office, who is, and I, I referenced, who is the boss of the high school principals, where we are gathering your voice and your experience as, around what we can do better to uh, make plans with student input. So their, their input is always real, honest, and helpful. And there is much of it that immediately the next day in the high school principal's meeting was being used. So I just wanted to highlight our students. And then I'm also celebrating um, a public comment that we heard this evening where we heard a community member call in and reference the way that she would like for us to refer to students with disabilities. And what is important to me about that is that that conversation is existing amongst us right now. She expressed a specific sentiment with a specific request. Others could call in on the exact same topic requesting that we refer to students with disabilities with a different term. And I think that that's something that is very important as we proceed on our equity journey, whether we're talking about ethnic groups, whether we're talking about gender identification, whether we're talking about students with disabilities. And when we say equity, we are talking about all those groups and many others that I didn't reference. But one of the things that seems particularly important, and her comment just gave me opportunity to comment on it tonight, is that as a community, we can feel very good about asking for others to refer to us in the way that we want. Recognizing that as an institution, we will always need to have global terms for how we capture students, but that we are always wanting, willing, and really celebrating the idea that people can ask to be identified in the way that they choose, recognizing that within groups, that may not be the same term for everyone. And so part of our equity journey is to really continue to welcome and ask for that input and then do our very best to make sure that in the spaces that we're in, we are honoring people in the way that they would like their group, their pronoun, their ethnicity, their language identification, their religious affiliation, et cetera, et cetera, to be honored. So I just am very appreciative of the comment and I think it gives us a lot of room to move forward together. Thank you for that update, Ms. Kerr. Yeah, I just want to thank you, Dr. Brown, um, for the work that you're doing. And I want to thank the parents and students uh, and community members who are engaged in that process. We hear a lot about it. And we hear two things. We know, we hear the urgency of the work, the urgency of now to do this work better, differently, moving forward. But we also hear the other side of that, which is we don't want to rush it and put something together that isn't meaningful. And it's a really delicate balance to move at a pace that feels like it's gonna honor both things. And I wanna thank you for leading that. I especially wanna thank the participants who continue to call us to honor both equally. Um, sometimes one night it's probably more the urgency and other times it's, but it needs to be meaningful as well. So I wanna thank all who are involved in many of those processes. It has everything from the leadership team to the work that we heard yesterday from Dr. Kale at Curriculum. The, it's the fierce urgency of now combined with doing meaningful work moving forward. So to all who are engaged in that work, both from a community standpoint um, and a district standpoint, I wanna thank you for trying to hold that tension really respectfully and really honoring that. Thank you. Dr. Benitez. 
I know you're going for your card. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, thank you uh, for that, Dr. Brown. So uh, given this uh, seemingly contradictory want urgency, but also need to take our time, it's not contradictory, right? It's just being mindful mm -hmm. uh, of, of the reason why we want urgency and the importance of why we have to be deliberate uh, with that to, to try to get it right. I'm wondering if you could, um, uh, as part of the update on what was done last week, if you, if you could, and I asked you at the previous meeting, you know, if, if there's anything that has caused you to take pause, all right. If you could talk a little bit about um, what that road looks like uh, over the next few months in terms of what you've been hearing from our student leaders, from our community leaders, and um, by that same token, uh, you know, what may be shared with us in, in not a time frame around deadline, but just what that road looks like. Sure, thank you for the question. So um, for one, I think the um, decision that you made on July 20th to have an equity update like this in every board meeting was a, was a strong statement going forward. And so it's given an opportunity to have ongoing updates like this. Going forward, what you can expect specifically from the equity leadership team is that I will continue to make update in each meeting. Um, I hope that going forward, the update will include others beyond just myself. Um, and that we will be bringing a, an equity policy to you for your approval in June. And that is the immediate work of the equity leadership team right now. In the next three months, we are working from sample policies, we are drafting language, and we will be bringing a policy to you for your consideration and hopefully for your approval. Um, however, with that, everyone who's on the equity leadership team comes with a story to tell, comes with perspective to share, and comes asking for a space to be able to do that. And so in our time, while we, our tangible product will be the creation of an equity policy, we are also building in time and other experiences for members of the equity leadership team to be able to share with us those experiences, those perspectives, and those um, things for consideration that we can attach to the other areas of our excellence and equity initiative. One of the things that's been present in the last couple of days is the extensive work that is happening around equity from all different lenses. And in the, the last two days, we've heard many of those pieces of work reflected already. The thing that seems important to highlight is that if there is an inequity anywhere in our system right now, it's not okay. And for that person, that group, that family that's experiencing that right now, it is not okay, it has not been okay, and it is not okay regardless of all of the work that we are continuing to do. And that is the balance that we are working to seek in our community right now, is the recognition that there has been harm, the recognition that we have work that we are doing, the way that we would like to go forward together, but the acknowledgement that even when we get to the place that we hope to be, anytime something happens that feels inequitable, it's not okay for that, for that person. So I hope that that gives kind of a snapshot related to the student equity work. We are just continuing to um, enjoy hearing from our most important customers and to building from what they share with us into the schools, into our district practices, and really letting them lead us in ways that we could have been doing long ago. We could have been doing long ago, and we will only do more of going forward. And so I just continue to feel that anytime we can be in a space with somebody who's less than 18, or, or maybe you're 18, I don't know, it's wonderful to have you here. Anytime that we can have a student with us and, and leading us through their lens, that's a, that's a good space to be. I hope I, I hope I answered some of what you hope to hear. Okay. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, do we have any more questions or comments for Tiffany? No. Thank you so much. <clears throat> okay. Now we're actually at report of board members, and we're going to start with Mr. Otto. 
So, so thank you, and uh, you're absolutely right. It is light outside, and it's hard to imagine. But um, you know, I, I'm, I'm a new board member. I've only been on the board for a couple of months now, but um, I have been so proud and astonished at the goodwill that the people of Long Beach, and in particular the people in the Long Beach Unified School District, who I mean, who have kids here and are involved with the district, have been showing this district. I knew the reputation of the district before I, I ran for this seat, but um, it's almost as if people go, okay, we know who you are, we know what you do, uh, we're gonna give you a break even though this is such a frustrating time, as we heard tonight from, uh, from so many people on the phone. Um, we are, I, I want everybody to know, and I, I know my colleagues well enough now and the staff to, to say that we are all anticipating a return to school of all our students as quickly as possible, but safely. And that's what's so hard for people to understand because I heard so many comments tonight about people saying, I want my kid back in school tomorrow. I want my kid back because of what that my, my child has, uh, has, has gone through and I don't want any more delays in this, but what people fail to appreciate for those of us who are working on this every single day is how first incredibly hard and talented how hard this staff has worked and how talented uh, they are. I, I, I am just amazed at what they do, how much thought has gone into this. Um, when we started to move forward, um, uh, we were having Zoom calls with principals, visiting schools to find out exactly where the entrances would be to, for kids to come back to school and where the safe places were if somebody had a temperature or had something wrong. That there were enough seats in cat class for the students who are gonna be able to come back. And when I say be able, I don't mean because we weren't gonna let somebody back, but because there had to be social distancing. There had to be hand washing. There had to be mass. And all those things had to be worked out on an individual basis uh, uh, with, um, uh, with each of the schools uh, in, in our districts, and that required an incredible amount of work. Um, we, I, I've been on Zoom calls with PTA people to ask, uh, uh, you know, we had 170 at Lowell on the phone the night that, uh, that I was there asking questions about what's gonna happen, how are we gonna do this, and to the best of our ability, and, and uh, uh, Brian Moskowitz and and uh, the principal uh, at, at Lowell, we, uh, we tried to answer as many questions. I feel very confident that once kids get back into the classrooms, a lot of those questions will be answered. It's just a heartfelt uh, feeling on the part of the parents and the kids that they don't know for sure, but I'm sure that it's gonna work out. Um, we feel confident that we're gonna get our kids back in school as soon as possible, as quickly as possible, but that they'll be safe, and that's the most important part. We could never let that go, and we haven't let that go, and uh, like I, I started these remarks with, um, we're all looking so forward to having kids back in school as soon as possible, returning to normal, and we're heading in that direction, and we've done it in an incredibly responsible way, and uh, I'm looking forward to it. Thank you, Mr. Otto. Mr. Miller? Thank you. And I wanted to follow up on Doug's comment here uh, in regards to us being the board, uh, newest board members here. So we've been on the board a total of 91 days, 22 hours, and about 31 minutes. Who's counting? But who's counting? I'm, I'm not counting, of course. Um, I wanted to acknowledge, uh, first, all of the hard work of the uh, staff over the past two days. Uh, for me, uh, I was jokingly saying with my colleagues that I would consider myself the greenest, no pun intended, uh, board member when it comes to these workshops, um, or at least the board workshops that we had uh, over the past two days. And what I most appreciated was 
uh, the quality of work, not just the work, not just the stuff that was presented to us, but it was clear that the processes were concise, uh, they were well articulated, and I was just very much appreciative of everyone's hard work. So I wanted to uh, commend you all uh, for uh, sharing uh, the information that you did, helping us as board members be just a little bit smarter uh, as we continue to uh, represent our small piece of uh, the city of Long Beach. Um, one of the things that I wanted to highlight in particular was us talking about excellence and equity, which was kind of the undertone of a lot of the workshops. Uh, with that said, uh, one of the things that I took from that was understanding that this process was going to be messy. And that, for me, in all honesty, was kind of tough, uh, mainly because I have consistently been concerned about emotional casualties when it comes to talking about the tough conversations of equity, and I use the uh, analogy of peeling off uh, a Band-Aid when you have an injury, but this isn't uh, oh, a wound, this thing needs surgery. And so when you're talking about surgery, blood can get everywhere. And sometimes uh, you're concerned about the wound getting infected, and so you're doing a whole bunch of triage, and that's the way that I think about uh, this process of equity and excellence in this district as we've had a lot of success, but this is gonna take a lot of work and it is going to get scary and messy at times. And so uh, I just wanna make sure that I continue as I recognize very similar to a surgery that there are people who are directly in the wound, patching it to a certain extent, that there's also somebody around the edges kind of cleaning it up to make sure that the space is not too uh, dramatic for for us all and so I kept using the term of making sure that our students uh, in particular had a landing spot for those emotions at times uh, so I wanted to make sure that I continue to uh, though we're going to be continuously approaching uncomfortable conversations I do want to make sure that our young people in particular when we do the work that we're doing also have some form of landing spot um, so more to some of the funner stuff. I think I've done enough um, um, landing of this event that I'm having, and so why not share it one more time? I'm hosting a college fair in a couple of weeks, uh, thanks in part to our uh, local council member or one of our local council members in Al Austin, uh, who has been sponsoring this event for the past eight years now. Uh, this event is going to be focused towards HBCUs. Now, in the past, they were able to do uh, on-site acceptance, which was fantastic. Uh, I was able, when I was back in my Operation Jumpstart days, to help students literally get accepted to four-year universities, to be the first in their family to go to college, right there on the site. And so it was an awesome opportunity. Obviously, we're in a different time where this is going to be a virtual event, but as I was sharing with you, Kara, uh, I'd love for you and your friends and uh, as many people as we can get to come to this event. I think on the Zoom platform that we have, we have about a thousand licensees. We already have over 500 people registered for the event. Uh, it's going to be pretty awesome uh, in regards to the presenters and the scholarship opportunities as well. Uh, a lot of people have been recognizing the power of attending an HBCU, and as of late, uh, they have received more funding this year than they have in the past 20 years, so there's also a lot more funding for the students as well. So this is, once again, like I said, going to be a great opportunity, and I'd love to have as many of our uh, students from the 11th to 12th grade years to be in attendance. Um, I wanted to give an update on my communications plan as I'm still absorbing as much information about the district as I can, uh, while also obviously putting together uh, my website, Facebook, social media, the whole uh, shebang. But I still have been participating in a number of community events. Uh, most recently, I was able to participate in uh, uh, Dr. Benitez's uh, community forum or community office hours a couple of uh, weeks ago. So I wanted to thank him personally. I've also participated uh, in a parent night with Webster, and then I'll be hanging out with my buddies over from J-Rob. 
that's what they call it in the streets, everybody, uh, on uh, uh, tomorrow. So looking forward to that. And I'm hoping to have a full rollout for all of my constituents, hopefully in the next two weeks. Uh, that's the plan. And last but not least, I uh, just hope that everybody is having a happy and safe St. Patrick's Day. As a county, we're doing fantastic in regards to our COVID numbers. And so I hope that we can continue to stay vigilant, vigilant so that we can uh, beat this thing outright. And so uh, though I want people to have fun, I want you to be safe. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Kerr. Thank you. Um, I'll be brief. I want to start with students. So uh, every year we get invited to Lakewood High School's NJROTC Pass and Review. And in years past and in person, it is very formal. Um, all the cadets are there in their dress uniforms. They're presented with awards that, with work that they've done around um, competitions that are academic or cybersecurity. Um, their, their drill teams, well, you can't do that this year. So Captain McMacken extended the invitation again for a virtual pass and review. So while we weren't reviewing them, we got to hear from them in a way that we, I haven't had the opportunity to hear from them. So the student leaders were asked what their responsibilities were. And so they went through leadership and talked about how they cared for each other if their job was academic support, that they were reaching out to their fellow cadets to offer support and tutoring and resources for that. And it was a wonderful window into the work that they do that you don't see when you're just watching from afar. So I wanna thank Captain McMacken and the entire uh, team for their great work this year. And most especially, I thank them for showing up for each other. So I watched on that call and I listened on that call to the way that they have engaged their peers um, to engage in new ways, to ask for help, to reach out, and to continue to excel. There are also great videos of uh, socially distanced drill team performances as well, uh, but wanted to thank them for the invitation and, and the ability to be with all of them on screen. Uh, second, I wanna shout out the student cam C-SPAN competition uh, winners. Well, the ones who won, but all of the students in at Long Beach Poly and Mr. Montu's ninth grade class who submitted videos on extraordinary topics. There was at least one third place finish and several honorable mentions. So if you go to the C-SPAN student cam website, you'll see a list. You can see all of those videos that our students put together on everything from housing to black women's health and inequities and segregation. And again, they're talking about the hard things and they're getting interviews and doing their research. And I'm just so proud of the work that they continue to do again in a time and a year where they were doing all their interviews virtually and figuring out how to do this thing in this time. So th congratulations to those students and to Mr. Montooth for his continued leadership. I had the honor and opportunity over the last couple of weeks to be with the Hamilton parent community, Longfellow, Hart, Henry, um, our CAC, Last week, I have several, I think I have one tomorrow. I had two last night, so I was, I was balancing two um, for those return to school conversations and what that would look like. And I wanna thank the parents for continuing to ask us those questions around how we are gonna keep their kids safe, how we are um, putting student needs at the priority in those meetings. But I also wanna shout out, and I. I can't remember, you're gonna, you're gonna have to share credit, Mr. Moskowitz and Dr. Lund. I'm not sure who said it, because it's at the top of my page. Um, but one of the things that was said yesterday that was the first thing that I wrote in a series of pages was the commitment and priority to quality distance learning for students who will remain at home. So we've talked a lot over the last couple of days and we're having lots of meetings in our community about what it's gonna feel like and look like to be learning in person on a school campus. But we know that at least half, if not more, of our students are continuing to learn from the place where they are currently learning, whether that's home, a motel, a family member's home. They're learning in all kinds of places. And I wanted to thank you, whichever one it was, and it was certainly in a thread through, for that commitment to serving all of our students. And 
and I'm reminding myself that in this moment that feels hopeful and sunny and the sun is out and movement towards hopefully being more healthy as a community, that not everybody's still healthy as a community and that that prioritizing quality distance learning for students who will remain where they are learning currently as the anchor to the work that we did uh, was a good reminder to me. So thank you for that. I want to acknowledge that in our excitement and in our wanting some students to be there, it's not a choice everybody can make right now. And I commit to me, Megan, my I statement to continuing to hear the voices of those families who are learning from wherever they're currently learning as we move forward. And I want to hear what is going to make you feel safe. So the you out there um, and, and what your needs continue to be because your needs may change after some students return to a classroom. You might sense something different and really wanting families and students to continue to connect with us to make sure that if there's something slipping that we didn't see or anticipate, that there's space in our conversations to acknowledge that and adjust to make sure that our students who are learning, uh, continuing to learn from where they're learning, have every opportunity as well. So thank you for that. Um, and I wanna thank, and I said it to the Lakewood students, Thank you for continuing to engage with your peers and calling them into community. It's a really hard thing to do right now in a time when we're told it's, you know, we're socially distant. But I hear you and I heard them calling their peers into community, even when it's hard. Like, hey, somebody's saying, turn on your camera. Hey, I want to see you there. So to the students who are not only showing up for themselves and their own work, but you're showing up for your peers, and for your siblings and for your cousins in order to get through. I just want to say thank you to those students um, and to the families and the carers and the kin and all who are uplifting students right now. Thank you for continuing to do that in a time that I, that I will reflect personally feels overwhelming but hopeful. But the weight of this last year all of a sudden feels really heavy again as we as we feel the entirety of a whole year of this and looking forward to, to a change. So to those families who continue to struggle, um, carers and kin who are uplifting, not just their own family, but potentially their neighbors, um, providing for basic needs, thank you for doing that. I wanna say that I see you, I acknowledge how hard this moment is, and in our hope and excitement and deep gratitude for staff and the work that they've presented over the last few days, um, this hasn't been perfect. I've said that many times. Our response hasn't been perfect. We'll continue to make mistakes. We'll continue to have bumps in the road, as Ms. Travers said. Um, but to authentically be there and listen, um, tell us what those bumps are that I may not have seen um, so that I can do better, I appreciate that. So to all who have contributed to my learning in the last two days, uh, thank you. Thank you. Dr. Benitez? Thank you, uh, President Craighead. So I wanna start off first by apologizing to Ms. Ocampo and the Chavez uh, families. Um, they had their parent uh, meeting today on returning to school and I said that if there was a little bit of time in between closed session and our open session that I would try to pop in. Um, we literally went to like 510 right today, Dr. Baker in closed session. So it was just not possible, but I look forward to circling back and and checking in with Ms. Ocampo and, and, and trying to connect with the Chavez uh, families. Um, a little history trivia on St. Patrick's Day because it has an additional uh, historical meaning, uh, meaning for uh, Mexican Americans and Mexicans. So we call uh, uh, St. Patrick's Day San Patricios because a uh, few hundred um, of European immigrants, including uh, some Irish uh, immigrants, defected from the U.S. Army uh, when the U.S. invaded Mexico in 1846, between 1846 and 1848. So we celebrate St. Patrick's Day in Mexico on September 12th in honor of um, those Europeans, and some of them were U.S. citizens, that defected and fought on the Mexican side in their belief that it was an unjust invasion uh, of Mexico by uh, the US uh, at that time. And because of their defection, 
they were treated as traitors and executed, uh, many of them. So we honor uh, our European immigrants. Uh, many of them, again, were um, US citizens that um, decided that we're gonna fight on the side of justice um, and risking their lives uh, for that. So um, just wanted to highlight that there's an additional layer here of, of pride and celebration uh, uh, for, for our um, St. Patrick's Day uh, celebration. Um, I, I wanted to provide a little bit of clarity. I kept on mentioning uh, today to check out the board uh, workshop, check out the board workshop. So um, Mr. Itzen shared that although the um, videos are available the very next day, um, and, and they, they, um, they do take some time because of the captioning, uh, right, to, to, to be more uh, accessible and, and, and around um, ADA compliance, but also because we also provide real-time Spanish um, and Kamai uh, interpretation that they are av uh, available, but it takes about a week, right, Mr. Ritson, to, to get back with the captioning. So thank you uh, for your work uh, on that. And um, lastly, I wanted to share, um, as Mr. Miller uh, mentioned, my community office hours and um, the urgency conversation that we had around equity, uh, Dr. Brown. And, and so what, I, what I've been hearing from community members on an ongoing basis is um, there's a heightened urgency because of the so many moving parts uh, right now. And um, parents that have, for many reasons, have had challenges in, in accessing information and communicating um, with our district. Um, that's why I was so appreciative of, of the parent meetings, the virtual meetings that we've been hosting uh, across our district to provide that information. And so in particular, um, the equity urgency around uh, parents, um, non-native English speaking uh, parents sharing uh, the magnitude of the impact that it's not okay, as you said, Dr. Brown, and the struggle of um, understanding that there's so much information right now and that they just don't have the information in a way that uh, is accessible and makes sense to them and that they can best support their students. And so um, whether it's um, our students with disabilities, uh, our emerging bilinguals to add another you know, English learner or emerging uh, bilinguals, um, our, our families are feeling that urgency in, in unique ways because our district is moving, it's, mo it, it's, it's moving parts, and um, the feeling of isolation and being left behind as we are celebrating an in-person return to school, that at the same time, it heightens that feeling of not knowing and not really having the information in the tools to, on the one hand, make decisions, but ultimately support uh, students uh, on that level. So I think as we continue to lift up and center student voices and community voices that um, I wanna keep encouraging community members, as my colleagues have already alluded to, um, that even when we've failed, even when we've not done right, whatever that feeling may be by you, um, that now's the time to give us another chance uh, to build trust again, to build faith uh, again uh, in our system, uh, because without you continuing to provide public comments as an example, in whatever language you can provide them in, uh, to whatever extent you use the correct technical words for a lot of the educational terms that we talk about, uh, that ultimately it is our responsibility to be responsive, to listen, and to uh, use that to guide our conversations, our strategic thinking, and ultimately our decision making. So thank you to the community members that with all those barriers, all those challenges, evidence uh, of distrust, um, that that acknowledgement, as you pointed out to today, Dr. Brown, I think is an additional on-ramp to give us another chance, continue holding us accountable, and um, 
leading with us so that we can do better. So thank you to those community members. Uh, again, call, call it in, email it in, uh, in whatever language you're most comfortable uh, with. Thank you, President. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'll just keep my um, comments brief because we've all talked a lot about what's happened the last couple of days. I do want to express my gratitude to staff, um, you know, not just our executive staff, but uh, the principals, teachers, and, and others who have come to us in the last couple of days uh, talking about their experiences, not just during the pandemic, but with the excellence and equity work. And you could, you could see I, I kind of think of it as a parade of stars that, that came to us because you can see their, um, their passion for education. You can see how deeply they feel for the students they serve, and they're willing to make mistakes uh, because of that passion. And so I thank them. I thank everybody who's uh, come before us the last couple of days. Um, I also want to thank the Riley principal, um, Mona Cook, because I was able to do a tour at Riley of how the campus is being prepared for the return of students. And I asked a favor of her. I, I asked if she could host the Lakewood mayor and the Lakewood vice mayor because after seeing, um, or after participating in that tour of Riley, uh, it was evident to me that seeing a school campus prepared for the return of students gave me the confidence that uh, the safety of our students was paramount and that every protocol was in place. And I knew that our uh, partners in the city of Lake would be, would be interested in seeing that. And so, so Mona agreed to do that. Thank you, Mona, it was wonderful. The mayor and vice mayor came and we toured the campus and uh, they were impressed. They were very impressed. And by the end of the tour, they were offering to help and we were trying to figure out, you know, how we could help each other. And um, it was a great uh, relationship building activity. And so I want to thank them for, for uh, joining us and doing that. And, um, in talking with Mona Cook about the return of our students, um, it, it became evident to me that we, we have to still be mindful of those kids that we have at home. And I know we've talked about that and our staff has talked about that. And I'm so glad we've talked about that because this is a big part of the return is also the kids that are remaining at home. And so I know that maybe some of us are feeling celebratory and we might want to make a big deal about this return to school. It kind of feels like a first day of school. And for a lot of our kids, it will be the first day of school. For our little TKs, our little, our little kinders, that might be their first day of school. But I just want to caution our, our, our parents not to get too um, overzealous with this because this little bit of school till the end of the year is different. This is a different part of the school year. It's not a regular school year. The classrooms don't look the same. The desks are socially distanced. There's a um, screening process you, you go through. There's, um, you know, everybody's gonna be kept separate. It feels very different and we need to treat it as a very different situation. And so I know being a parent myself, we have the tendency to want to pose our kids and, um, you know, take pictures. And I, I don't know, I've heard about people wanting to do like a big balloon arch or, you know, something to celebrate the return of kids. And I'm just saying, please hold off on that. To me, it doesn't feel like this is the time to celebrate because we're still in this pandemic. And we have to be mindful of the fact that approximately half of our kids are at home, half of our kids are at school, we're still one school community at each school site. And so let's make decisions that affect all the kids, not just the kids who are returning physically to the campus. And that might be difficult because 
I think it's just, you know, in our nature, some of us, that we want to celebrate things. But I just want to caution people to, you know, be mindful of everybody. And also be mindful of the situation because we still have people suffering the effects of this COVID impact. We still have people out of work. We still have people sick and recovering, not recovering. So let's all be vigilant. Let's, let's make sure that we're making choices that keep our communities in mind, um, our neighbors, our communities. Let's be safe. Let's continue to wear our masks. Let's continue to be social, socially distanced. Um, you know, tonight's kind of a special night for some people. Let's do it safely. Let's, you know, we have um, Easter coming up. Let's, let's proceed cautiously. I'm holding on to the hope that we can come back in the fall together, that we can bring all kids back together in the fall. Let's not do anything to jeopardize that. That's, you know, that's my plea tonight. That is my plea. Um, okay, next. Uh, superintendent's report. Sure, Dr. thank Baker. you. I'll be brief and then Dr. Brown has something that she'd like to say as well. Um, first of all, I just want to thank the board for two great days of learning and discussion and for really getting into some good dialogue about the work that we're doing right now and the future of the work that we'll do in the district. I really appreciated listening to your voices. I know um, our staff will be talking a lot about the discussions this, the, these last two days and thinking about um, how to proceed forward. So I really appreciate that. I um, also just want to thank the Browning team. This is going to become our board home um, for the spring until the end of the school year. And I know it takes a lot of work as well as our interpreters. So in the room, we have staff that are interpreting in three languages. They've been with us all day yesterday, today, and um, into the evening, as well as our marketing and media staff who has worked tirelessly to make the live stream happen, to work with Letitia Rodriguez around public comment and it doesn't happen without all of that behind the scenes work. So just thank you to, to that team that makes it all happen. And I will turn over to Dr. Brown. I know that Dr. Baker likes to highlight student successes in her superintendent's report and I was fortunate enough to receive a copy of a book entitled A Kid's Guide to Radiation Therapy. This was written by a graduate of Millican High School. Her name is Giovanna Quevedo. She is currently a Cal State Long Beach student, and she wrote a book for children who are undergoing cancer treatment to explain the concept of radiation therapy. This book was illustrated by a current student, Nala Haley, who's a Millikan student. And it's just a really wonderful representation of what people can do together, and specifically what people can do together through hard circumstances. So Giovanna shares a personal story in this book that connected her to the work. She hopes to have a medical career, and I think she's well on her way. So I just wanted to highlight that. Wow, that's fabulous. Ms. Kerr, you're reaching for your card. Oh, okay. Announcements. <laughs> Thank you. I was waiting. I'm trying to be polite. Wait my turn. Um, thank you for sharing that with us, Dr. Brown. So two quick announcements. Uh, one is the logistics. Um, President Craig had already talked about continuing to make good choices around health and safety because they don't impact just your family. They impact our greater community. So while there is a tendency as we reopen to want to connect, um, please make sure you're following those guidelines. She did that already. Uh, second thing, as teachers return and staff return to sites next week, uh, traffic patterns will change in the city for the first time in a year. And we all know what that initial first day of school looks like, but we also know that there are parking conditions that are impacted by families who are still at home. So just an awareness on everybody's part to pay attention to the parking signs. I know um, there's street, been street sweeping issues. We know folks have been parking in bus zones um, in front of some of our school sites because school is not in session, but as school returns to session and our students who need transportation will be arriving by those buses, so to be mindful of the parking signs that maybe you weren't paying a whole lot of attention to in your neighborhood um, 
for the safety of our students as they return. But also Voice Waves, which is a student-led uh, publication in the city, is looking to publish stories highlighting local youth experiences during the pandemic with a focus on how it's impacted their education. They're looking for interviews with students, parents, or both, written pieces or podcast, um, but they want to assist the youth in publishing their own stories. Um, and it says that they'd be paid for doing so. Uh, they are having a, um, a workshop this Saturday that's open to all community members who might be interested in participating. So I don't know if it's voicewaves.org or voicewaves.com, but I will, it's probably not. I will try and find that. But Voice Waves, if you Google it, Voice Waves Long Beach are looking for students to tell their story. So please, students, tell them your story. Okay, do we have any um, further announcements? All right, then without uh, any objection, we will adjourn the meeting. Thank you all for coming and thank you Akira for staying to the bitter end.